Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the Infertility Workup. Before we get started, I would like to go over a few quick items about today's event. All physicians in attendance will receive an AMA PRA Category 1 credit, and all other providers will receive a certificate of completion for one contact hour credit. Their certificate will be emailed to you by Harvard around midsummer. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Max Klein is a reproductive endocrinologist at Boston IVF Syracuse, New York Center. Dr. Klein received his medical degree from New York Medical College, completed his OBGYN residency at Wake Forest School of Medicine in North Carolina, and his fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the University of Vermont's Robert Lamar College of Medicine. He was previously a clinical instructor of OBGYN at the University of Vermont, where he taught the next generation of fertility experts. Dr. Klein is a member of several reproductive medicine organizations, including the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. We encourage you to submit questions to Dr. Klein using the questions section of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentation. Okay, let's get started. I'll pass it over to Dr. Klein. Thank you again for joining us today. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. Um, today's lecture is a, uh, a recap on some basics of the infertility workup and evaluation. So I hope to give some basic background on what we do and also um, let you into my head in terms of how I think about this when I approach the, um, the new patient evaluation. Um, some objectives for today, let's know the basic definition of infertility, know the basic causes of infertility, um, and really understand the principles of evaluation for both male and female infertility. Although we focus on female infertility, we do a lot of male infertility basic evaluation and, and referral to urologists. But um, uh, I wanna go into some depth about this and um, also, um, cover our concept of ovarian reserve as this tends to predominate a lot of the evaluation. Um, so basic definition is um, uh, trying to conceive um, and your inability to get pregnant after one year of trying. Um, it can be loosened to 12 months of not using protection and also without conception. Um, and this does um, uh, assume that ovulatory function is there. Um, if somebody's anovulatory, this doesn't even apply. You can go right into the evaluation. Um, and then there is this age caveat of over 35 years, you only have to be trying for six months. Um, oftentimes after the age of 40, you don't even need to have had a history of trying um, before coming in for the evaluation. But just to know that infertility is a, is a disease of the reproductive system that impairs the body's ability to perform the basic function of reproduction. So how do you get pregnant? Um, this is uh, maybe a, a silly question to such an educated audience, but um, really let's, let's try to frame this conversation as, um, as both a very easy um, conversation as well as a very complex conversation um, uh, coinciding at the same time. So what do you need? Well, you need sperm. You need an egg, you need patent tubes, and you need a uterus properly prepared. Now, there's a lot of subtleties in this. Um, you don't just need a uterus, you need a uterus that is ready, um, which is the, the phrase properly prepared. And so when I talk to, to patients, I'm, I'm emphasizing that timing is, is uh, essential. Timing is essential um, to make sure that everything is happening like it should. Coordination of this process is essential. But when it comes down to it, you really only have three variables. You have the sperm, the egg, and you have the uterus. And if it's not working, you change one of those, or you try to, um, or modify, or use our technologies to adapt the, the problem of one of these three variables. So from a very simple standpoint, it's really just three things that we're looking at. Um, so then after you have 
the egg and the sperm combine, you do need a lot of little things to take place inside the body. And it would be great if we had this like little microscopic camera, like if you could go back to the time of the magic school bus and go inside the reproductive system and see the egg and the sperm combine and see the transport down the fallopian tube and see the implantation. I don't think they ever made that magic school bus episode, but um, uh, maybe that'll be my life project um, uh, towards the end. What do we do with this? Well, um, oftentimes with IVF, we can see all these things happening, so you don't need the magic school bus, but in the body, it's still kind of curious how this happens or where in the process is it not happening. So to start out with, it's not a finger pointing game. It's never a finger pointing game. Um, and, and that's what I emphasize uh, to a lot of couples is that it's a, it's a couple's problem. And that about one third of infertility cases can be attributed to male factor. Um, and about one third um, uh, to factors can be attributed to women. Um, for the remaining one third, um, infertility is caused by usually a combination of problems in both partners or in about a 20% of cases, it's unexplained. And this unexplained category is very curious to me because um, I'd like to say that there actually is a reason that we might be able to pin it down at some point in the future, that we might come up with a sophisticated test that will tell us exactly why uh, it's not happening and that it's not unexplained. But suffice it to say, there there are things that we haven't developed a test for yet. So let's start off with the male evaluation and the male workup. Like I said, 30 to 40% of cases are um, attributed to male factor. And um, we always do a male and female evaluation in parallel. Um, occasionally I'll get a guy that's resistant. It's not me, I'm not the problem, um, and tries to play the finger pointing game. And that's just not, not appropriate. We need to evaluate men and women um, when the uh, two are present together as a couple, we need to evaluate them in parallel. Um, get a thorough reproductive history. We need to focus on medical problems, medications, family history, social history, and occupational history. I, I tend to focus on the occupational history in my area because regionally I see a lot of state workers. I see a lot of uh, blue collar workers. Um, you know, it wasn't uh, something that I saw very much in training, but I see guys that clean up toxic spills on the highway, and that's their job. Um, so it is it is relevant. Um, I saw another guy uh, not too long ago that um, his job was to work in a plastic melting factory. I mean, talk about exposure history, that, that pretty much rings the bell. Um, if we were to do a physical exam on a male, although I, it's been a long time since I have, um, you would do a basic um, uh, male reproductive system evaluation with focus on the testicles and the testicular volume. Um, but sperm is really what it comes down to, and we need to look at this under a microscope. The most common male infertility factors include not producing sperm, azospermia, as well as oligospermia, um, producing few sperm cells. Um, sometimes sperm are malformed, sometimes they die before they can reach the egg. In rare cases, infertility in men is caused by a genetic condition, such as cystic fibrosis or a chromosomal abnormality. But when we talk about the basic evaluation, it's important to emphasize some instructions, no lubricant, masturbation, or special semen collection condoms are available. It can be collected at home or at the laboratory, um, and body, transfer, body temperature um, uh, is important to maintain during the transport. So there's a strict one hour cutoff um, that was set forth by the WHO. Um, and it's, uh, it's something that has to be uh, abided by in order to standardize this type of testing. But the semen analysis looks at a lot of different um, uh, criteria. Really what it comes down to is, um, is really three basic factors. Um, we have count, motility, and morphology. The count is basically the volume and the density. Um, so if you have a slight, slightly higher volume, we tend to see a slightly lower concentration and vice versa. But um, sperm can have a lot of abnormalities, and it's always uh, a funny talking point to mention the guys that the majority of sperm is abnormal, and that it's normal for a guy to produce only 4 or 5%, 6% normal sperm. Um, and occasionally we do get these 911 phone calls when the results get released to the portal. And so if you don't warn them in ahead uh, or ahead of time, it, it can be pretty jarring to find out um, once the results come in. 
But the um, WHO is uh, who sets our criteria for what the basic volume count, progressive motility, um, morphology should be. And these are all reported um, on a standard semen analysis. Now, you can have a semen analysis done by an individual, or you can have a semen analysis done by a um, computer chip reader. Um, I prefer the individual. I think it, it provides more of a complete um, assessment, albeit um, it's been criticized as maybe subjective. There are different ways that a semen analysis is performed. Um, when there is an abnormality in the semen analysis, um, notably a count or a motility problem, then we typically go on to hormonal evaluation, checking testosterone primarily, but also um, after testosterone FSH. We also throw on LH and prolactin routinely. We also throw on estradiol routinely, but um, this is more for the urology uh, urologist to, to further interpret. Um, we basically look at testosterone and FSH to get a general sense if spermatogenesis is normal or not because the FSH will tell you right away as well as the testosterone level. Um, there is an advanced test for sperm DNA fragmentation that is offered. Um, who needs this and what do we do about it is always the question with any test. Um, and this is my favorite prescription um, to give after um, this comes back abnormal, which um, is frequent ejaculation. So there is a theory out there that, um, that sperm has um, an index of DNA fragmentation and above a certain index is abnormal. And this might lead to either infertility or increased risk of miscarriage, increased chromosomal abnormalities. And the way that we fix this other than diet, lifestyle modifications is um, frequent ejaculation. So I, I love to give that prescription to guys. Um, no, no fewer, or sorry, no more than two or three days um, without having sex or masturbating. Um, men with azeospermia, this is a unique circumstance, azeospermia, no sperm, or severe oligospermia should be referred to a urologist or a specialist in male fertility. Um, we typically get karyotypes, Y chromosome micro deletion testing, and if there's absence of the vas deferens, then um, the um, cystic fibrosis gene should be tested for. Female infertility. So the majority of the evaluation um, is focused on female infertility in the office. And this is where we're going to talk next. Um, the, most common, the, the most common female infertility factor is an ovulation disorder. Um, other causes of female infertility include blocked fallopian tubes, which can occur when a woman's had pelvic inflammatory disease or something such as endometriosis or other surgery. Um, congenital anomalies involving the structure of the uterus or, or uterine fibroids are associated with repeated miscarriages and infertility. Um, but it all begins with the egg. And I'm not necessarily promoting this book, but um, I do have a lot of patients that love it. Um, I've read it myself and I, I think there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of valuable information in this book. Um, it's easy to go down the rabbit hole with, with sort of supplements and everything, but it, it all begins with the egg or it starts with the egg. And I tend to agree with that. So where do eggs come from? Well, they come from uh, the ovary and they come from uh, the, um, the primordial pool of follicles. And I make an analogy that's kind of like a champagne glass where these bubbles tend to percolate towards the surface. And it's not necessarily one wave. Um, they're constantly percolating towards the surface. And, and so it's, it's good to dispel some general myths um, when, you, when you talk about eggs and ovarian reserve that, um, that the, the eggs that are there that this month, it's sort of a use it or lose it phenomenon. It's not like they're gonna be there next month. Um, I had a patient recently who really wanted to jump into an IVF cycle because her, her antral follicle count was higher than it's ever been before. And she wanted to go on birth control to make sure that we saved those follicles and they didn't go anywhere. And I, I had to tell her that it's not, it's not my understanding of how it works. You know, there's the, the basically there's a constant um, uh, percolation towards the top and a constant attrition that's happening. Um, so there is a little bit of a random um, uh, assessment that happens when you look at one snapshot during time. Um, but before looking at this ovarian reserve concept, I got ahead of myself. Um, first, we need to discuss whether or not there's ovulation. Um, so how do you evaluate for ovulation? Well, first, simply ask, you know, are you having regular cyclic menses? That usually can tell you right away, especially if someone is very textbook clockwork 28 day cycles. Now that everybody's tracking their period on their phone and apps and watches and everything. Um, 
there are um, basal body temperature readers, um, and I still have some patients that, that look at this, um, although it's it's an after the fact evaluation. Um, ovulation predictor kits are more widely used, and the simpler is better, in my opinion. Um, you can check at day 21 progesterone, um, mid cycle sonograms, look for a collapsing follicle, look for a corpus luteum. The, the serial basal body temperatures um, are um, you know, it's fascinating to chart, but the key is what is the hormone that's causing this basal body temperature to rise, and this LH. And if you're trying to catch ovulation for any useful purpose of getting pregnant, then you want to know before the body temperature rises, which is typically after ovulation. So you want to check for that LH surge. And how do you do that? You do that with ovulation predictor kits. Um, ovulation predictor kits, uh, it's always nice to, for me to hear how the lines are changing, although you can get nutty with um, trying to interpret the lines. It's sometimes simpler to use these clear blue ovulation tests that use smiley faces instead um, because it just makes it a little bit simpler for the patient to interpret. But aside from that, if we want to be even more um, uh, methodologic uh, or pedagogic about it, we would, we would do a transvaginal um, sonogram to actually look and see what follicle is growing and correlate the hormone evaluation with that. So where the estrogen level is, how it's rising, when the LH level is starting to rise. Um, we tend to get that type of information in our office, but um, outside of a fertility office, it's usually kind of hard to grab. But you can still get a general sense of, of if, if a woman is ovulating just by doing serial transvaginal son sonograms. Um, egg reserve. Egg reserve is a key topic of today's um, uh, fertility evaluation because it's so easy to get. Um, and from birth to menopause, we know that there's a certain number of eggs, there's a certain number of follicles, and that over time, um, the, the fertility of a woman goes down and it's, it's across all race, ethnicities, across all populations. Um, so as we get older, the, um, the reproductive efficiency as well as the number of eggs goes down. And there's a way of testing this through um, multiple means. The classic way is through a day three FSH, cycle day three FSH, although it could be collected cycle day two through four. And we always get an estradiol with this to know that the FSH is not artificially suppressed. Um, the anti-malarian hormone is really the, the hot topic right now, especially with some updates in PCOS. Um, antral follicle count is another way of measuring ovarian reserve, and the COMET challenge test is still being done. Some states, such as Massachusetts, actually require it for some insurance companies. Um, but AMH, AMH is typically um, defined as being normal if it's approximately one to three and a half. Low ovarian reserve is typically less than one to maybe 0.7 or 0.5, depending on which assay you're using or which, um, uh, which criteria you're following. But what's really exciting about um, AMH is that it's, uh, it's something that's consistent over the, the menstrual cycle. So you can draw it at any time. You know, where are you in your cycle? Oh, you don't have a cycle. Oh, you don't know where you are in your cycle. Well, guess what? Today's a good day to get your AMH drawn. So you can draw it any time. And the level should be consistent. So I try, to, I try to make as many analogies as I can to what people know already. I say the AMH is sort of like the A1C for your ovarian reserve, although it's, um, it's, it's a little bit more uh, broad in timeline compared to A1C. It's not just three months. It's, it's probably over the course of six to 12 months that, that you can estimate what the ovarian reserve is. Um, so it doesn't change fast either, or at least it shouldn't. If it does, there, that tends to um, mean there's a problem going on. Um, but what's exciting is that um, from the recent uh, um, release of some international PCOS guidelines that we can use AMH maybe not necessarily as the diagnosis of PCOS, but it can be used um, to define the PCO morphology, what kind of PCOS we're looking at. And, uh, and in a simplistic way, I look at AMH as telling me how severe PCOS is. Is PCOS um, going to be much more resistant? Is it going to be much more brittle? Is it, are the ovaries going to um, have a very thin threshold until they all of a sudden respond more than we need them to? This is what I find AMH to be very useful for with PCOS. Um, but antral follicle count is probably my second go-to aside from AMH. 
um, because we do so much ultrasonography. And if you do an antral follicle count, in particular when a woman is in the beginning of her cycle, cycle day two, three, four, you want to see somewhere between six to nine eggs, or I should say six to nine follicles. You know, not, you can't really see eggs, um, but there should be an egg in each follicle. Um, and six to nine is normal. Um, somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 from one ovary is considered high, and that kind of goes along with the PCO diagnosis. Um, aside from the ovary and the eggs, you do need patent tubes. And there's three ways of evaluating this. There's the classic HSG. It's been around for many, many years, and we still do it often. Sonohistogram um, with uh, some air contrast um, can also be used, and we do a lot of this in our office, again, because we have such ready ultrasound availability. Um, or you can go straight to surgery and do um, chromotubation, chromopertubation. Um, this is the gold standard, but involves a laparoscopy, so it's not commonly done anymore, at least um, not unless there's a compelling reason to. But um, basic HSG, place a catheter, inject dye, watch it spill. And you get to see open tubes pretty clearly. Um, I would say even more so clearly than our ultrasonogram um, evaluation, but um, you don't tend to get um, as, as good of a view of the inside of the uterus. So the cavity evaluation is not compromised, but um, it is not as defined. Um, but if somebody has some sort of risk factor for tubal disease, um, some sort of history of ectopic, history of appendectomy, ruptured appendix, something of that sort, I usually go straight to HSG and will then get a sono um, hysterogram to complement the HSG. Um, now, with the uterus, um, how do you evaluate the uterus in other ways? Well, so a day 21 progesterone is sort of evaluating that the uterus is getting the proper um, cycle of hormones. You can try to look at a luteal endometrium on ultra, ultrasound, but it's not really gay. It's not, there's no measurement that's useful for much after ovulation occurs, other than there is a luteal endometrium that's present. Um, like I mentioned, we evaluate the cavity, we evaluate on HSG for a filling defect, or you can just look inside with a camera, hysteroscopy. This would be the gold standard, but again, requires a surgery. Um, endometrial biopsy is no longer done on initial evaluation, um, but we still do it under certain circumstances, in particular when patients are um, anovulatory for a long period of time. This can be helpful to find if there's any hyperplasia present or, God forbid, any sort of um, neoplasia present. And um, it can also be diagnostic for chronic endometritis, um, and uh, it somewhat depends on the lab that you're sending the sample to, whether or not they're gonna be looking for those CD138 plasma cells. Um, proteomic markers, not ready for prime time, maybe. Uh, some would argue it is ready for prime time, and that's why there are some commercial assays available, such as the um, uh, ERA endometrio um, or the Receptiva um, biopsy test. Uh, basic proteomic markers to look for um, unique circumstances. These are these are not. This is not the basic fertility evaluation. This is the um, complex. We're trying to crack the code fertility evaluation. Um, but the saline sonogram is, like I mentioned, way more sensitive for seeing any sort of filling defect, whether it be a polyp or a fibroid, something that's affecting the internal cavity of the ultrasound and therefore affecting implantation. So what do we know so far? Again, mature, healthy egg is needed, capacitated sperm, fertilization and zygote progression to blastocyst, an open pathway and, passageway and a receptive uterine destination. Can we really test for any of these? And the answer is not really. Um, so I hate to give you this entire, um, uh, this entire evaluation to say that it's really underwhelming, but, but we're looking at reference markers for all of this. Just because the, um, the egg, or the, I should say the follicle, is a um, healthy size doesn't mean that there's a healthy egg. Just because the sperm is swimming well and looks morphologically normal or in a normal percentage doesn't mean that the sperm is fertilizing the egg. Um, just because fertilization happens doesn't mean blastocyst progression happens. Just because the tubes are open don't mean, doesn't mean that the, the tubes are actually moving the, the embryo into the uterus. And just because the uterus is 
well prepared on ultrasound measurement doesn't necessarily mean that implantation is going to occur. So it's very simple and very complicated at the same time. Um, one thing to emphasize to patients, not to just kind of kill their spirits right out, the, uh, out of the gate, is that human reproduction is terribly inefficient. It's really not um, what we would call efficient, at least for, for all animals considering. I mean, um, occasionally you get that, that patient that the month she comes off birth control is when she gets pregnant, you know, the, one, the quote unquote one shot wonder patients that, um, that make everybody else uh, feel really self-conscious that it's not happening. But it's, I think it's important to normalize the, the fact that monthly chance of conception for any no, just average couple that's trying is somewhere around 15 to 20%. 15% um, per cycle to clinically recognize the pregnancy, 20% per cycle, including a biochemical. But at, you know, while inefficient, most couples do cross this 50% line after three to six months of trying. And so here comes in the you know, six months to 12 months of the, the definition is that you really should see pregnancies in the majority of couples after six months of trying and definitely after 12 months of trying. Um, but you know, let's, let's take a step back too and maybe acknowledge the couple as, as you know, a, a human, uh, each person in the couple as, as human individuals, which is that infertility is very stressful. And there's multiple domains affecting the quality of life um, that are involved for both men and women and for both partners in a same-sex relationship. There's marital stress, relationship issues that can, that can um, result. There are self-esteem issues, self-image issues, financial issues, if none of this is covered sexual functioning issues, family expectation issues. There are therapists that specialize in these areas that can also be very helpful. There are fertility coaches that can be very helpful. Um, and I've made referrals and had amazing uh, um, uh, responses about the impact that that's had on their experience through this journey. Um, seeing somebody that's that works as a fertility coach. There's fertility yoga out there, there's acupuncture. There's a lot of other modalities to um, make this a tolerable process to go through. Um, and that, uh, I, I, this is my kind of uh, um, social plug that infertility is not an inconvenience. It is a disease of the reproductive system that impairs the body's ability to perform the basic function of reproduction and that it affects a ton of women, millions of women and their partners in the US and about 12% um, of the reproductive age population. And that um, most infertility cases are treated with conventional medical therapies, such as medication and or surgery. Um, so this is my plug for coverage. Um, uh, also my plug for um, addressing some basic social history uh, issues that um, men and women who smoke um, have decreased fertility. The, the jury on THC for women, I think, is still out, although it has pretty strong evidence to affect male fertility in, the, in a negative way that also the, the risk of miscarriage is higher for pregnant women who smoke and up to 13% of female infertility um, is caused by cigarette smoking. Um, some non-fertility tests that we do run routinely include expanded carrier screen testing, so testing for autosomal recessive conditions. We tend to really push this in our office because there's something we can do about it if something comes back abnormal. You know, if you're the average couple trying to get pregnant, this is not something that you typically think about, um, maybe outside of the Ashkenazic Jewish population, but um, this is something that we do routinely pick up um, common carriers every year that then go on to do something about it with IVF. Um, so we, we tend to screen for um, some sort of panel above the, um, say, cystic fibrosis, fragile X, spinal muscular atrophy trio. Um, I, it's been, uh, it's been suggested maybe we should move to the super expanded panels that are including 400, 500 genes, or maybe stick to the, um, like sort of standard panel that, that carries a lot of the common genes, uh, somewhere around hundred, 120 genes that it tests for. Um, I think what we're finding in particular is that the, the standard panel for couples that's around hundred genes is, uh, is probably fine for most couples. However, if anybody is in the realm of using donor sperm, uh, probably use the expanded, the very expanded panels that contain four or 500 genes as the sperm banks are pretty much screening all their donors with these very expanded panels as well. Um, there's more details involved in that too, but um, 
some sort of autosomal recessive screening is important. Um, and then preconception care is, in general, a great time to practice preventative me medicine and encourage lifestyle and behavior changes that might be uh, to patients that might be more open and motivated to begin. I've had so many patients that that tell me, you know, it wasn't until they tried to conceive that they really cut down on their drinking or they really started exercising, they really started watching what they ate. Um, so it's it's sort of a moment of vulnerability that that can um, be a stimulus for change. Um, so with that, uh, I thank you and I invite any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein. We're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during the presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel. Our first question, how do you manage testing for patients ovarian reserve who are not trying to get pregnant? Yeah, yeah, good question. Well, I guess, um, you know, in my office, pretty much everybody's trying to get pregnant. But occasionally, I do have patients that are trying to preserve their fertility, whether it's create embryos in advance or freeze eggs electively for planned oocyte cryopreservation. But I think that um, the, the standard ovarian reserve assessment would include um, looking at um, AMH and antral follicle count, um, specifically the antral follicle count when you're at uh, a baseline of a menstrual cycle, if, if the patient knows or has one. Otherwise, just getting a simple AMH can be a triage step. Um, and that's the way, I mean, I, I tend to order everything up front because by the time you're seeing me, we're, we're here ready to hit the ground running. Um, but from a non-fertility, non-infertility office standpoint, I think AMH would be the best thing to order right off the bat because you can get it any time. You don't even have to worry about where the patient is in their cycle. And regardless of what it was or where it will be, this is serving as a reference point for right now that then can be compared later. So AMH number one, and then if you have access to an ultrasound, it'd be great to get a, um, what we call a baseline antral follicle count at the beginning of a period. And then if the AMH is um, abnormal in uh, in a bad way, meaning uh, low, very low. That's usually where the cycle day three labs I, I find to be more useful, um, because while the AMH is that sort of gas tank, that sort of A1C over months, um, at least three months, if not six or more, um, the cycle day three labs really tell you in the moment how the engine is working. And so if the AMH is low, then I'm really curious what the cycle day three FSH and estradiol look like. Great, thank you. Um, how do you treat a short five to six day luteal phase? Yeah, that's really short, um, five to six days. I mean, the the question becomes, you know, is it the uh, is it the front or the end? Is it the chicken or the egg? You can always slap on progesterone and prevent a period from starting. I mean, that's birth control. That's you know the mini pill um, or double the mini pill, and that that creates um, uh, typically amenorrhea. But are you really fixing the problem um, if you don't fix the follicle that then is really responsible for producing the endogenous progesterone? So, um, sorry, kind of a wordy way of answering your question, um, which is a good question. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize is that uh, sometimes just giving progesterone is like slapping a Band-Aid on um, a gaping wound, okay? Maybe you need something more than just a band-aid. Maybe you need to like fix the diabetes that's creating this non-healing wound. Um, so why not try creating a stronger ovulation, creating a more uh, a robust ovulation event? So this is where Clomid comes in. This is where gonadotropins come in. This is where the trigger shot comes in and create a healthier ovulation to produce a healthier natural endogenous progesterone. And then you can discuss progesterone supplementation on top of that. But I'd, I'd be curious how the luteal phase would change if the follicular phase was enhanced to begin with. Thank you. Uh, moving on to our next question. What would be the key markers that would suggest trying IUI for two to three cycles first before going to IVF? I don't know that there's necessarily a, a key marker. Um, I would say that it more so depends on the couple's goals and their circumstance. You know, the the IUI couple is a little bit younger, um, typically, or maybe 
prone to uh, or more inclined to do something that's less involved, less invasive. Um, you know, a couple that's desiring something less invasive is not a couple for IVF. Um, a couple that's desiring something more natural is not desiring is not a couple for IVF. Um, and when it comes to markers, you know, whether it's it's AMH or, or anything else, almost uh, more of a abnormal AMH uh, sometimes leads us to IUI because then IVF is going to be less successful and less productive because IVF often gets its success because of how many eggs we're able to get. But if your ovarian reserve is low and you're not going to get a lot of eggs, then IVF may not be actually worth your while. Um, there needs to be sperm there um, for IUI. So that has that is sort of a given that there's going to be a sufficient sperm for IUI if you're going to pursue IUI. Um, but I would say, okay, to answer your question, the markers that are there um, is going to be uh, um, probably somebody that has a reasonably normal AMH um, that is happy with at least one child um, and uh, desiring a treatment that is less aggressive off the bat. Um, it's it's multifactorial. It really it's hard, it's hard to answer um, such a question too in, in the realm of insurance coverage because, uh, in, at least in my region, um, half the time insurance tells me what to do. So it's you know it's kind of a simple uh, recommendation to me at least from the standpoint of uh, let's let's do what your insurance will cover. You can always pay out of pocket if you want, but um, most patients will want to do what their insurance covers. And half the time the insurance tells me that you have to do IUIs before I, IVF regardless of what the markers are. Great, thank you. Um, if we have another question here. How do you approach treatment of infertility for women who are not ideal ca candidates for pregnancy, i.e. a BMI greater than 60? Sorry, I, I, I got uh, lost in thought at, um, That's a for a moment there. Repeat the, uh, the no beginning. Problem. How do you approach treatment of infertility for women who are not ideal candidates for pregnancy, i.e. a high BMI? Oof, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I think it, it begins with a realistic conversation of the risks that um, such an individual will encounter in pregnancy related to the underlying uh, uh, medical condition. So if we're talking about high BMI, um, not that I'm trying to pawn it off to my high-risk pregnancy colleagues, but I try to give them, number one, an opportunity to meet with them um, to, to know exactly what a pregnancy is going to entail with a BMI that high. Um, then uh, there needs to be general uh, medical evaluation from a primary care physician, making sure that all routine health maintenance is up to date. Um, general routine uh, female health maintenance is up to date with pap smears and such, mammograms if indicated. Um, all that needs to be addressed. And then we have a specific um, nutritional referral program for our patients, for fertility patients, that is geared towards um, uh, everything that goes into weight loss, not just diet, not just um, exercise, but also medications as well. Um, to try to optimize weight before pregnancy and optimize BMI before pregnancy. And so that referral takes place too. So it's it's sort of a, a meeting of the minds, if you will, the what's coming next, what could be addressed now, as well as what could be changed now. That's, that's how I approach it. Great, thank you. Uh, we have one more question here. How do you adjust the timing of labs for women who may have shorter or longer cycles than 28 days? Um, depends on what labs we're drawing. Um, AMH doesn't matter. It's kind of the thing, uh, the, the, the benefit of AMH. Um, the beginning labs don't typically matter. So cycle day three labs or cycle day three labs, regardless of if somebody is a 24 day or a 28 day cycle, maybe the cycle day two labs might be a little bit more accurate to the form um, compared to cycle day three in that patient, but they pretty much stay the same. Um, what's, uh, a little bit of a misnomer is the cycle day 21 progesterone. It's not really a cycle day 21 progesterone. It's a seven day post ovulation progesterone. And so if you don't ovulate routinely, some women know they ovulate on, you know, cycle day like 16 or 17 or 18, and that's just their norm. And that's okay. That's fine. Um, well, there, it's not going to be a cycle day 21 progesterone if you don't ovulate on cycle day 14, because that's where the 21 comes in is 14 plus seven. 
So if you ovulate routinely on cycle day 17, then it's going to be a cycle day 24 progesterone for you, and that's going to be the normal progesterone check. Um, but I would say uh, I, I try to keep in mind in every patient that I treat, like what is their typical day that they're ready um, for ovulation. Um, and we, we get that sense because we bring people in for monitoring so so much so, so i'm kind of at a, at a luxury here because i get to see what people's hormone levels are i get to see what their lh levels are i get to see what their estrogen levels are i get to see what their ultrasound looks like and and we get to we get to sort of tinker with things but um in general nothing nothing really changes um uh at the beginning i guess it more so it's um if somebody has a shorter cycle it makes me uh um, anticipate earlier ovulation Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein, and thank you everyone for attending today's webinar, The Infertility Workup. If you have any other que questions, please contact Alyssa Cooper at ecooper at bostonivf.com. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you would complete the survey and provide your feedback to help with future educational webinars. You will also receive a follow-up email with, within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view the recording of today's webinar. On behalf of Boston IVF and Dr. Klein, thank you so much for joining us and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, bye-bye now.